So we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands which UT now stands, pay respect to the elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within this community. And um, now I'd like to hand over to, to Ian, who will start today's proceedings. Thank you. Uh, welcome to you all. Thanks very much for coming along and spending a significant chunk of your day here. Um, it's interesting doing these meetings, the kind of seating dynamics. You can see who the QUT people are. They're comfy sitting down at the real board table. We've had um, Sydney and uh, Victoria. We did threaten them with having to recap the day's events through interpretive dance or mime if they sat up the back. So thanks for spreading yourselves out. Um, Oh, I'll just go back. So this, ooh, there we go. Okay, so we're going to have a little poll during the day and it's going to ask just a couple of questions about the summary um, points that we're asking people about. So this will flash up again a little bit later on, but if you can be ready just to type that in, there'll be a point for questions towards the end of uh, my talk and there's a question and answer session after that. So today we're talking about the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, as I said, I'm the acting director of the ARDC. Um, a lot of my uh, colleagues are here in the room today, a lot of familiar faces as well, which is really nice. Today is pretty, it's a big day and it's pretty packed. Um, the first session will be me going through some background, uh, some summary ideas about where we think the strategy for the organisation could go, some of the outlines in terms of timeline, budget, uh, how we propose to deal with the next um, three to six months. There'll be an opportunity for question and discussion after that, but if you have any questions as we go, then please do pipe up. We'll have to shoot a microphone off to you but um, just feel free to stop us at any point. After lunch, we're gonna split into uh, what we're calling satellite meetings. So meetings reflecting on our strategy, but in relation to particular big ticket kind of initiatives that we need some guidance on. And this exercise is really about us having gathered a lot of information so far and asking uh, you what you think about the proposals we've got for going forwards. Some will be familiar to some of you, some the nuance might be different and some the actual approach might be quite different as well. So we'll go through a little bit of background, uh, some partners, so nearly everything we do is through partnerships uh, and we're taking a slightly different uh, definition of partners. Um, and I'll be talking just about a small section of those and highlighting why we are uh, making a you know, particular kind of fence around those. Uh, and then the strategy discussion uh, later on, about which we'd really like your feedback. Okay, so there's another reminder for the poll. It's really quite weird looking sideways at the projector. I'll just look forwards down here. Okay, so a little bit of background for uh, people who don't know uh, Enchris. Does, does everybody in the ro room know about Enchris? Or does anybody in the room not know about Enchris? Okay, so this will be quick as well. So Enchris, big, uh, originally capital um, project for collaborative research infrastructure. There are a lot of different projects and this is important. We'll come back to that in a little bit. A lot of institutions are involved, a lot of uh, staff members are providing services into that and an awful lot of researchers benefit from uh, that activity. And Chris, as you know, has gone uh, from a capital stage, it had a few years of operating kind of life support uh, mode and has now had a capital refunding for some but not all of the projects. A little bit of history of Anne's Nectar and RDS, so again, if you're all familiar with uh, NCRIS, I'm sure you're all completely familiar with ANS, Nectar and RDS. These are three of the e-research focused uh, projects within NCRIS, um, but had quite different approaches to stakeholder engagement, as well as quite different um, products and services that they provided. So RDS was probably the most technical of the projects and it was around national uh, collections, so collections of data, and around the infrastructure around those. And the engagement model for that was through um, partnerships with uh, e-research organisations, who we refer to as the Node community, uh, and they were spread all around Australia. Nectar had the same Node community involved, with slight you know, differences in the detail, but the, generally the same communities. But Nectar was around the uh, Federated Research Cloud, which was really a very innovative idea at the time. And so that was a sector-based uh, compute and uh, virtual machine cloud. And the virtual labs that sit on top of that. So collaborative platforms, 
I guess, designed to democratize the ability for people to get access to high quality research workflows and instruments. And then on top of that, if you like, surrounding all of that was slightly more nebulous Anne's agenda around the quality of data. And what does that mean? And how do we increase the general level of skills throughout the whole community, not just researchers, but also research administrators, institutions, as well as uh, the providers of those services? How can we make sure that we're leveraging all of those investments to provide maximum benefit both to the researchers as well as to the people who are funding that research? Now, in 2017, um, the Department of Education asked us to align our activities. They said, look, you three are parts of the same problem. Can you please make sure that those activities are as coordinated as possible? So we created, we, we were still three separate organisations, but we had three business plans that were linked together by one overall umbrella business plan. In 2018, we've now uh, integrated into one virtual organisation. So we still have three contracting partners. We, we now have one board. Uh, and we have one management group across the whole uh, set of activities. The intention is that in 2019, we will uh, integrate into one actual legal entity as well. So that is a work in progress trying to define what that is, whether that's a single university lead agent or a joint venture or a company limited by something or other is something that's being worked on at the moment and something about which there are many, many opinions. Um, so. Interestingly, with 24 um, NCRIS projects, there are practically 24 different ways of running an entity. So there's plenty of depth in terms of examining how you can run organizations. And there are ones that are run you know, well with different models and less well with different models. So that's a bit of work that our board in particular is working quite hard on. What do we do? We have quite a broad range of uh, services which we uh, I guess, provide in, in inverted commas. So some of these are provided directly by ARDC. A lot of them are provided through our partnerships with uh, organisations such as the nodes or institutions. Um, now, some of these in here are less obvious, but are actually very influential. So the government policy one, we, uh, the ANS group in particular, um, has been regularly called on to provide advice to uh, the government around research data policy and has, has also provided a whole bunch of material which it's fed upwards. So it's had quite an important role in, for example, the various guidelines and codes around research management. Uh, the International Leadership and Engagement, Australia is one of the founding uh, partners of the Research Data Alliance and uh, ANS has always had a very strong role in that. So ANS has always had quite a strong international presence. Uh, the other ones you'll be familiar with, we've touched on briefly, the publication services refers to things like the handle services, the, the DOI minting, IGSN, and also Research Data Australia. So, you know, the, whether having two, one thing called RDA, which is Research Data Australia, and another thing called RDA called Research Data Alliance, both within the same organisation is a good idea, is a good question. Nonetheless, they're both very useful. They both provide uh, lots of value. And RDA, as in Research Data Australia, is uh, a tool we're looking at how we can really exploit and grow that uh, in terms of how we can push the agenda we have for fair data. And one of the beauties about RDA it's a great portal itself, but one of the real advantages for it is that it's very easily scraped by other uh, directory services. So it's easily scraped by Google and provides a very easy entry point for that uh, dissemination of data. Now, we've been reviewed many, many times, and one of our reviewers is in the room, Rob, down there. So we've, we've had various reviews uh, individually and collectively about how we can address the question of providing effective e-research services to the community. Um, some were more technically focused, so how do you bring those pieces, the more mechanical pieces together? How can we improve the connection to industry? And some were a little bit more around data and where are the various organisations in their journey uh, on data and how can we add value to that. The upshot is we've had many reviews, some of which have been made public, uh, some of which have been kept within the department for their own consumption. Were there any consistent messages across those? Now this is a very high level description of the consistent messages across them. Uh, 
One was delivering integrated data intensive infrastructure. So what does that mean? It means we had a storage capability, a compute capability, a virtual lab capability, and a quality and curation of data capability. How do we bring all of those pieces together so they're eas more easily used uh, by researchers and more easily explained to institutions? National coherence. So that first one is nice for all of the services and the pieces we do, but we're not the whole picture in terms of e-research and certainly the world has changed a lot from the original NCRIS investments. Uh, at that point, the NCRIS capital was sort of the gorilla in the room for uh, investment around these pieces. Now institutions, quite a few institutions make uh, local investments that dwarf our total investment. And so we're more, uh, we have a slightly different role in there. We're the, 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 it's a much smaller stick, that's for sure. Um, but also we're only part of that uh, worldview. So for example, AAF providing identity, we have the HPC capabilities of PAUSI and NCI. Uh, we have Arnet who provide not just the network services, but are moving up through the stack. And now I'm sure you'll all be aware of Cloud Store and some of the other storage services that Arnet provide. And they have their own roadmap around e-research. So how do we, um, as really kind of independent of all of those pieces, what, what role can we play in bringing those, all of those bits together to make them more easily accessible by researchers? And why are we doing any of this? So in bringing ANS, Nectar and RDS together, the first step was to try to develop some shared language. So, so we could at least share a target from three sets of people who really had very different specific goals, um, what were the higher level goals that we shared? And we came, we came up with these four uh, transformations, which uh, if you dealt with last year, these were part of our uh, program structure. So deliver a world leading data advantage, accelerate innovation, improve collaboration for borderless research. And by that, we don't mean uh, just international collaboration. We mean between states, uh, between institutions, and sometimes even within institutions and to facilitate translation of research into outputs. And that is one of the harder ones, the translation part. Now, in all of these, we are not going to be driving translation as ARDC, but what we can do is work with our partners to hopefully make an environment which uh, makes it easier for researchers to uh, create that translation. Our view is we, um, our role is to have impact on the people who have impact. So we're part of that research workflow. And why would we do all this? Well, really, because it's a competitive world in research as in anything else, and we want to make sure Australia's researchers are as competitive as they can be. I'm sure you will all know what FAIR is. If not, there's a remedial e-research class which we can send you on. Uh, so findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. I only put that there because it relates to the next slide. Those transformations are pretty high level, you know, fluffy unicorn goals that we would aim for. How do we break them into something that's a little bit more actionable? It's something that we can actually identify programs around and start to work on. So we've uh, come up with these themes. So these are all the things we'd like your commentary on uh, both in the Q&A session and also in the following satellite meetings. Um, FAIR as a concept is generally used around data and uh, some might say generally overused around data. And so we're going to overextend it again, which makes Keith die a little bit on the inside. But we're going to use that model of FAIR to say, well, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, obviously around FAIR, that fits within one of our transformation agendas. And FAIR research data is uh, a positioning piece to make, uh, to drive maximum value out of those data resources. But we can also use that paradigm to say, well, we want to make the Australian e-infrastructures e more fair as well. So making them findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable is one of the programs we'd like to look at. The research platforms, so that includes the virtual labs as well as data access services. Uh, and then the last one, which is really crucially important, is uh, it's great to have fantastic, high quality, findable data, excellent tools to use that data and, and whiz-bang infrastructure that enables you to move through all those pieces. If we don't have 
a research community who are able to understand and exploit that, then we face a different set of challenges. So the skills program has been core to uh, all of the programs, all of the projects, but has been addressed in slightly different ways. So we have a specific satellite breakout around skills, and it's been interesting as we go around the country. So I should say this is one of a series of meetings. We've had a meeting in Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne and Hobart already, and we've got Adelaide and Perth later this week. And uh, you'll see in the questions that come up, there's a one about what, what, where do you think the emphasis, emphasis should be around these themes? And we've had quite different results. So in fact, four meetings, I think we've had four different results across who, what they think the emphasis should be on. But skills we feel is really a core component of making sure that those pieces are used effectively. And how will we try and develop those programs? So in the increase roadmap, uh, there was a, a loose collection of organisations. So the e-research organisations, uh, ARDC, AAF, NCI, uh, PAWSI and ARNET. Um, they were the digital data and e-research platforms or DDERP. Um, and so this, this is a new grouping which we've been working together with those uh, organisations about how can we align and coordinate both knowledge sharing about what we're up to and what our strategies are, but also the services and finding out how we can piggyback off each other and provide the best benefit without duplication, without stepping on each other's toes. Our e-research organisation, so the Node community is still a very valued part of that system. What the role for the nodes uh, going forward will be inside that system is uh, one of the subjects for discussion today. Uh, institutions have always been engaged with quite deeply by ANS. We've not always had a very uh, closely tied technical conversation with the institutions about what is your strategy around some of these underpinning resources and how can we align with that. And then of course commercial resources are a much bigger player now than they have been historically. And how do we loop those in in an appropriate way and commercial solutions have pros and cons. Around uh, this work, we've so particularly around the platforms and the infrastructure side, we've engaged uh, two consultants to help us with that. So Max Wilkinson from New Zealand will be looking after um, the infrastructure side, and Nigel Ward, who many of you will be familiar with, looking particularly at virtual labs and platforms and what our strategy for those might be and what's the demand for the community, what's the shape of those things going forward. Now, we have quite a broad set of partners in there, but one of the really critical pieces is that we're part of the NCRIS network. NCRIS itself is an aggregator of, of communities, sometimes around technology, sometimes around domains. So if possible, when we do engage in activities, we will be looking at who the uh, appropriate NCRIS capability is to partner with on those. So for example, we're talking with Bioplatforms Australia around some bioinformatics activity, uh, AAF is a kind of quasi increase thing. So we're talking with AAF around identity stuff and, and uh, the, the characterization capabilities would be a logical point when we talk about that type of activity as well. So working through the increase network uh, will be our first, I guess, checkpoint whenever we took a look at activity. Um, and then we'll be working with our DDA colleagues as well to make sure that we're uh, distributing that work or allocating that work in the most appropriate way and that also we're not having two groups of us doing the same work at the same time. So just to quickly run through those uh, groups again, there's the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre in Perth, uh, NCI, who didn't give me a nice uh, blurb slide, so that's just the front page of their website, Arnett, who gave me a very nice blurb site, uh, and so you can see Arnett Arnett's agenda is shifting a little bit over time and so we just need to make sure we understand that and that we can work closely with them. And the AAF, of course, this is possibly the first time AAF people have seen how I munch their slide, but that's fine. Gets the general message across. <clears throat> All right, so we've talked a little bit about where are we from, uh, what's the big picture strategy we're aiming for, how have we broken that into um, some little some more kind of digestible and actionable themes uh, and some of the partners, the key partners will, <coughs> excuse me, will be 
talking to to deliver on those. And now let's talk a little bit about the approach we're aiming to use for that. And this approach is based very heavily on the CSIRO impact framework which some of you may not be familiar with. This is a bit of work um, that we've, we've done some workshopping with CSIRO around this, and we found this to be a really useful tool for re-examining the types of activities we do. And I guess if you were to boil it right down, uh, you start at the far end. What's the point in the thing you're trying to do? Uh, what's the impact it's gonna have? Now for CSIRO, it's a triple bottom line impact, so societal, economic uh, and environmental benefit, where does it fit in there? For us, because we're a little earlier in that research workflow, we've, we've started to redefine that a little bit in terms of our impact aim will be how, do we, how are we going towards our four transformations, whether we're able to deliver on those. And we break those down into what are the outcomes that are needed? So what, what are the products that are needed to deliver that impact? Uh, and then you break it even further down into who would participate in that, what are the sorts of inputs you need, uh, who are your key dependencies. So it's working from the end backwards, as you would do in project management, but with perhaps an even further view of where you're going. And so our slightly um, adapted version of that impact framework uh, looks a bit more like this. So the impact we're after is our transformations. The outcomes as we see them now would be things like the community development work, uh, which interestingly there's been a lot of uh, appetite for uh, ARDC really to act as an aggregator. So uh, events like this, bringing people together who don't necessarily always come together in the same room. Um, quality, both around data, so robust and reliable data, but also around tools and uh, collaboration between organizations we can uh, hopefully play an impartial broker role in there and then the skills work and the nature of the skills work is a really interesting one which we'd like to test with everyone activities would be the virtual labs uh, the clouds so what do we want a sector-based cloud if so do what does it look like how does it work who owns the various bits of it who how's it going to endure over time and adapt uh, and metrics. So we, the original capabilities were not set up so much with a view of measuring success and how you would actually show that they've been successful. So this is gonna be quite a key part of what we wanna do going forwards is to make sure that we do have robust measures for success because it's actually quite hard to go to the government and say, we need more money because it's kind of good. You sort of know deep down it's good. Uh, and so that's a difficult conversation. And the hardware infrastructure there, blank sheet of paper. So we're happy to entertain really all sorts of strategies around the hardware infrastructure part. Um, that obviously makes it quite a challenging job for Max to distill that into a strategy within a couple of weeks, but we're confident he can pull it off. And the two clouds underneath, really around, we have, a, a, we were successful in getting a capital allocation in the budget and we have an operational component as well. What we're trying to say there is uh, for the stakeholders and partners who come to us, think less about whether you think this is a capital project or an operational project. We'll worry about how that fits into that funding model. We have, like I said, we can operationalize a, a capital piece uh, and we can also capitalize a, a long-term operations piece. We haven't worked out how to capitalize a human yet, but we're working on that one. Um, so worry less about the, the money side in terms of the what bucket it comes out of and more around where it might fit in that life cycle and also a little bit, the next slide, a little bit how, about how, it, how that activity fits within um, the principles that we're going to use to look at these activities. So we have our transformation, so the long-term big picture uh, destination, the theme, so the more actionable parts uh, we've got, had a little bit of talk about the impact about how we're looking at breaking those activities up, how we're going to uh, evaluate and measure the proposals that come to us. Uh, we have these principles. So innovation, transformation and acceleration are probably fairly self-explanatory. So acceleration uh, really is around, is there a 
nationally significant piece of work that we can help an organization with that might shrink the timeline from five years to one year or something like that. The last two are really critical. National scope and scale and or scale. So we're a national collaborative research infrastructure project. We're not an institutional research infrastructure project. However, we're interested in looking at institutional projects that we might be able to translate to a national audience. Uh, and similarly, there are some activities which may require national scale and how can we facilitate generating that scale by bringing the appropriate people together. And the last one is sustainability. Everyone has sustainability in their uh, slide deck. For us, sustainability is how would this activity survive if we were to disappear? NCRIS is not always the most reliable funding source in the world. Um, and while we have some certainty over the next period of time, we do want to understand what happens to the activities we, we engage in when uh, either, you know, the government's, if the government's priorities change, then our priorities will change. How those activities might survive or transition out or how we can adapt and modify them going forward. So we've done some work on sustainability with the existing activities, but for new activities, sustainability will be a, a key consideration. So if you think that's the Venn diagram, obviously the sweet spot right in the middle. And if you've got a project there, then definitely come and have a chat. Sustainability wraps around all of them. Okay. But we're interested in any conversations in any of those kind of spaces. Uh, but those are the kind of key themes that we'll be looking around how we can uh, uh, decide on activities and also uh, remember that if we can leverage an increased capability, then that would be our preference to do so. So I'll just whiz very quickly through the next little bit. I just put this reminder up because some of these pieces that we do now um, are easy to change and some are less easy to change. So I'll go through some of the ones that are less easy to change. The publication services are relied on by an awful lot of people for a lot of different things. Uh, Finding the appropriate way to deliver those uh, is a piece of work we're going to go through uh, for the next little period. I think we're pretty comfortable that there will be activity we'll be involved in for some period of time. So whether we should deliver them or someone else should deliver them is really the question uh, for us for the, at the moment. The Nectar Cloud is used by an awful lot of people for an awful lot of different things. It's at really quite the pointy end in terms of infrastructure and how we provide that resource. So we need to come up with some good ideas uh, around that. And we are engaging with all of our existing partners as well as new partners to come up with ideas for how to do that. The virtual labs, which are really regarded as being one of the successes of uh, our part of NCRIS, they have evolved into quite different beasties on their own. Uh, and some are more engaged with their communities, some are less. That virtual lab world has been a little bit closed off to new participants for a while, partly due to the funding model. Um, we would like to discuss with people the potential where they would like to see virtual labs go, whether they'd like to see new virtual labs, different virtual labs. We could turn off virtual labs, whether we don't actually need virtual labs anymore. We need one big Lego lab where you can build your own lab. These are all good questions, which Nigel, again, will be providing a concise summary for our board very shortly. <laughs> And then the last part is our national collections. So we have considerable investment in uh, the infrastructure that runs those collections. That infrastructure also is approaching the end of its life and we need to work out what to do with those collections. Potentially how we can increase the value and visibility of those as well as the metrics around who's using them and how. But you can see there's, uh, there's about 40 something petabytes of data that's stored around Australia at the moment. And how, how can we you know, responsibly manage that in a way that still leaves us with lots of options going forwards? And then, and then the skills service, I just got the times up card. Um, skills, policy, engagement and consultancy. So the skills uh, activity is a big piece. We're trying to work out the strategy for that. That'll be with Natasha this afternoon. The policy work uh, is kind of the quiet achiever in the background that actually has quite a lot of influence both in communicating back from the research community to government and the agencies about you know potential challenges or opportunities and also back down 
making sure we have guides and uh, tools that make it easy to teach people how to do those pieces. Now, for all of these uh, activities, our position at the moment is that it's the function that's important. So we want to maintain that function, but we're quite open to different ways of delivering that function going forwards. I'm going to whiz through. These are actually the, the, the interesting slides. How much money is there? Uh, we've got $110 million for operations over the next uh, five years. We've got a $70 million capital allocation. Uh, the guideline around the capital allocation is spend it carefully. Uh, so there's two bits to that. A, spend it, and B, be careful. So that's what this process is around. We want to avoid uh, the very lumpy, bumpy investment that existed previously. We don't really want to uh, just create another problem in four or five years where we have to go through all this all over again. The timeline. While this is going on, we're also having uh, similar but more targeted consultations with our NCRIS colleagues. So the 24 of those meetings, uh, which my colleagues Michelle and Andrew are leading, they'll be wrapping up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're having these state consultations. Like I say, this is the last week of those state consultations. And on or around December the 14th, we'll be releasing the draft uh, strategy and capital plans. So there'll be the high level first cut summary of all the conversations we've had um, around the country and with all those organisations. And they'll be available for everyone to comment on. Uh, following that, we have a few months to deliver the final capital and uh, strategy plans to the department at which point we hope to have a very clear description to potential stakeholders, both what those programs will be, but also how you would engage in those programs. So at the moment we don't have the um, process documents around that, like is, is one gonna be an open call? Is it gonna be a targeted activity? Is it gonna, you know, what's the form gonna look like? We would hope to have the shape of those things roughly by, hopefully uh, in December, but if not, then early in the new year. All right, we might go. So that, that's really the end of my banging on. Um, we just have the quick poll and then we'll have a question and answer session. So do you want to whack up the, uh, oops. So you can point your um, mobile device or iPad or phone at the QR tag and hopefully that should pull up the address. You can also enter it manually if you prefer. Oh, except I've got it over the... Has everybody got the URL? Okay, so who has not? Okay, well, it looks like. Give it a bit longer. Okay, so who has not yet got the poll up and would like to get it up? A few people still? Okay, can we move it a little bit off the QR tag? Okay, so the address is ht, uh, etc.ch slash x7mk. They used to. Yeah, so this is also open to the, um, uh, the Zoom participants. So we'll have a nice mix here of uh, mainly institutions, few research, yeah, quite a bit of e-research providers and NCRIS facilities. So anybody need a little longer or has everybody been able to fill this in? Okay, great, then I'll move on to the next one. So the question is around which of the draft activity principles do you think is most important for us to consider in our strategic planning? So this is to guide us in our activities. Should we focus on innovation, transformation, acceleration, national scope, sustainability? 
Mm, sustainability is it's a bit like a horse race, really, <laughs> seeing who's going to win. I think for the next consultation, we're going to have to organise bets around this and see which one gets there first. Okay. Interesting mix of perspectives, sustainability coming out top, but still quite a lot of interest in national scope and scale and transformation. Hmm. Okay. Moving on to the next question. So which of the ARDC draft strategic themes do you, th do you think should be a top priority? So fair, fair or fair, which I don't mind, obviously, uh, but also a bit of skills and workforce development, and they'll be fair in that too, possibly. So, yes. And in case you're interested, these um, uh, we've done these polls in all our consultations and the ones that are still to come, and uh, we'll we'll make those available so you can get a bit of an idea what the audiences were like in the different uh, in the different cities and what the perspectives were like in the different cities too. So, so interesting in this case, fair platforms coming out on top. Okay, and. That's it. That was the last of the poll questions. Thank you all very much. Great. Thanks, Keith. And it is interesting because now we've had five meetings and five different results when there are only four options. So <laughs> that's, um, that's going to make life more complicated for Nigel. Anyway, good. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, opportunity just for questions um, around what I've spoken about. And I guess if you had any questions for each other around those poll results as well, that would be interesting. Um, some of the questions we sort of said, well, let's try and focus this a, a little bit. You can have questions on my uh, the general conversation now a little bit later on, but if you, you can, we'll have these questions around those satellites. But have a think about from an organisational perspective, we do a wide range of things with a wide range of um, participants and stakeholders. What could we or should we do more of or start doing? Uh, what could we or should we do less of or stop doing? And what uh, could we do differently? So that if you're desperately trying to think of a question to ask, that's a framework there. Otherwise, feel free to ask any question at all. Erin uh, Raymond, University of Southern Queens. Uh, when the money was originally approved in the budget, it was because some of the capital infrastructure was urgently requiring upgrade. And mm. that is still true for a mm. lot of the capital infrastructure. Um, but I see in your timeline, we're looking at investment flowing out maybe from March, <laughs> April next year. Yep. Is um, How do you resolve those two things, just in terms of some organisations requiring capital to be upgraded prior to that point? Yeah, so uh, the, the capital case was around the functionality around those pieces. So he said, unless we had some means of providing that resource uh, and generally through a capital investment, we would lose cloud functionality or we'd lose storage functionality. So we've not got off the kind of starting line as quickly as we would have liked to. Um, we do hope to have some, and maybe we'll do a, an interim step so we've already done one interim step around pieces of the work we do to say we're a bit behind schedule here's some funding to keep you going the collections and the cloud piece harder to do those interim pieces for uh, we're going as fast as we can um, but like i said the capital plan didn't say reinvest the funding in exactly the same way it was originally invested. It was make sure you don't lose that capability and that resource for Australian researchers. So this is why we're doing this actually quite quick, intensive process to get as much information as we can. That'll come out in the draft capital plan and we hope to be able to have those investments starting fairly early in the new year. So 
unfortunately, we can't go any faster than that to comply with the carefully bit, um, but we'll go as quickly as we can. My understanding of the capital funding was that that was granted on the basis that there is a market failure um, that, for example, the research funding agencies are mandating that uh, data is stored for a significant number of years. Uh, the, the, the research funding agencies are mandating that data is stored for a significant number of years and they're not providing funding for that. They're not providing funding for, for compute and other infrastructure. Um, how does that fit with your concept of sustainability? Because I, I think everyone wants to move towards a sustainable model, mm. but given that market failure at the moment with the, the, the other research funding agencies, how do you see sustainability coming over the next four years? Yeah, so that's we're working with the funding agencies around that question as well to say it's all very well to come up with a guideline that says you need to keep this stuff for 20 years but without providing some solutions for that, that's an unrealistic kind of demand. So that's a piece that's evolving too. In terms of our idea of sustainability, our view is how will that thing survive if we disappear, if we go away? So for example, if we were to invest in a state-based e-research organisation to provide that capability for some sector, then how would that survive if in two years the government changes its mind and closes down increase or whatever it is? How, what's the pathway that can happen there? So it's not clear, but I think one thing that is probably pretty clear is that relying on ARDC as a very long range funding source has some risk associated with it for people who do that. We're not saying that that may not be something we can do, but we're saying people need to think carefully about what happens if ARDC changes or increase changes or that funding supply changes. So it's not, it's not a very clear answer, but that responsibility really is a shared responsibility. There's the institutional responsibility to look after part of that. The funding agencies, I think, also need to take some of the burden there. And as much as possible, we'll provide resourcing into that as well. Um, Linda O'Brien, Griffith University. I'm just wondering how um, we're attempting to align our strategy with any national strategy around research investment generally and, and what's what's at play there federally because obviously there's quite, quite a lot of interesting discussion at the moment about what sort of research they wish to invest in. I'm just wondering how that ties together. Yeah, so um, we'll try and follow the national, the science priorities in our investments, but a, a lot of the, in, the activity we engage in is not necessarily focused towards a particular priority area. It's underpinning capability development. So, for example, what Phil was talking about, making sure that research data or, or whatever the resource is, is broadly available in a reliable and robust way benefits all of those priorities. But there will be activities which are specific priority areas. They don't feature as strongly in our agenda, but they do feature strongly in our colleagues within INCRIS's agenda. So they, we would expect them to lead that and for us to be able to support and partner with them in delivering on those. Do you think, ah, oh, splendid. There were two uh, aspects I didn't hear a lot about in your talk and uh, wondered where you're going. One is uh, international connectivity, how yep. Australian infrastructure becomes, uh, in, <coughs> interacts with the international infrastructure that's being established in parallel. And the second was um, support for interdisciplinary cohesion yep. amongst uh, infrastructure platforms. There's a lot going on to support discipline uh, platforms, but I wondered about interdisciplinary. Yeah, so that's, I guess, two parts of the conversation that we uh, want to dig into more this afternoon. So the international leadership part, firstly, there's a role for our community in leading and directing that. But secondly, there's a very important role for us to facilitate bringing that best practice back here. And we've, in fact, just engaged in quite a big exercise to look at uh, the state of play internationally around a particular domain. And so all of our activities, when I said we've got a blank sheet of paper in terms of, uh, ab absolutely, if the best solution for a domain is to subscribe to a 
uh, a, a domain platform of which the exemplar is overseas, then that's something we'll look at how we can facilitate that. If it's a stepped process of that is probably the leading platform, but we'd like to kick the tires here, how can we develop a test model for that here and just see where we can modify that? That's something we're open to as well. So we, we in fact, we do have a program which is around improving the ability for domain, uh, I guess, leaders to gather that best practice. Um, and so we have the ability for when we look at platforms to send people off to say, go and find out actually what's the best way to do this in the world and bring it back and then we'll act on that. And that's not necessarily sending ourselves off. It's sending whoever is the right person off to ask those questions with the assumption that they will share it with as many people as they can. So that's one bit around how do we follow international kind of initiatives. The other part around uh, interdisciplinary platforms, again, with our platform and virtual lab discussion, we have quite the main focused virtual lab activities at the moment. The data side is to some extent a little more around making the data just generally more acceptable, uh, adaptable to more people. And so again, this is a conversation to have here. There are domains who say, well, actually, we just want to continue to refine our super duper world leading platform. And there are other, I mean, Hass is a good example. Hass as a domain is a pretty broad descriptor. How do we create something that allows those multiple domains to operate on an environment in there? And that's that is actually a very difficult question. Maybe, you know, trying to do Hass is too big a bite. But that's one of the questions for here is to what extent is that cross domain, you know, breaking those walls down a little bit? Where is is that something we should really be focusing on? Um, Jane Hunter, I'm here um, as a representative of the Academy of Sciences National Committee for Data in Science. Um, my question is one of the key players and dominant players in this space in Australia is Data 61. Mm. And you didn't mention them at all. And you could see them both as a competitor and potentially a collaborator. Have you started discussions with them and how do you see RDEC working with Data61 in the future? Very good question. So I guess if you think CSIRO is sort of the size of a big uni and Data61 is a capability within that that provides a certain type of service to a certain type of people, we're very interested in talking to Data61 and particularly around how we can do work that complements what they're doing and how we can leverage the work that they're doing. There's a whole bunch of politics around making sure that that happens in a friendly way. So we didn't mention them specifically, but there's an awful lot of people we didn't mention specifically, but they're still key components of our partnership strategy. Really the ones I put up there were because they were highlighted in the roadmap as you guys need to come up with a, coherent structure around yourselves. But Data61 is, uh, again, key to, I think, delivering a lot of this. But how, at the moment, we're just kind of politely dancing around each other and hopefully we'll be able to build those links into something much tighter. So they're not uh, formally invited into the stuff we do just yet, but we do have quite a lot of informal links over to Syro. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Matt Belgard, uh, Director of eResearch here at QT and uh, also representing QCIF. Um, just a, uh, following on from Rob's uh, uh, comment, interdisciplinary. Uh, it's a really important dimension and certainly we start thinking about one of those criteria you talk about in translation, uh, the impact, the real world sort of impact. We need to be, we cut across these areas. So that sort of leads to that next dimension, which is how do we, how do you balance, how does ARDC balance legacy versus innovation? So we've got, as you've highlighted, a lot of legacy in terms of data and systems and laboratory VLs, but that innovation, how do we make that, um, that step and what's the process for retiring uh, things perhaps that may be uh, uh, very good and very well up to, uh, in terms of uptake, but in terms of best practice or best of breed, may not be the right strategy going forward. So there's a bit of uh, courage required to, to go through that journey. Uh, and, and, I, and I guess the, the last comment, given the roles that I'm in, I get to see a lot of activities 
of, I guess, microcosms of ARDC successes in cooperative research centres that are either starting or, or, or existing, centres of excellence in various areas um, are starting or existing. So how do, we, how do we leverage from all those activities so that uh, we can sort of not just go top down in terms of the directions uh, that you're trying to develop as a strategy, but also bottom up. So how do we leverage from that? And uh, relate to that, and then is you mentioned skills and you, you hope that, I guess, skills will be shared across um, uh, um, um, from people going out to find out what best practice is. But what's the process for sharing? I, I guess I'm always interested in that, the, the process. Thank you. All right, so the first one around um, really about are there things we sh we're doing now which we should stop doing and how do you decide what those things are and how do you stop doing that? What we are very conscious of is not creating shocks to the system and I think there are pieces which people would say definitely need to evolve into something slightly different or there are different directions they can go. Um, but it's... it's uh, a strategy of just turning those things off, I think, would not be helpful. There have historically been bits of national infrastructure that have suddenly been turned off and have caused huge disruption and loss of faith and trust. So what we would like to do is develop a roadmap <clears throat> for that March release, which basically says, look, we've consulted with an awful lot of different people from a lot of different directions. <clears throat> And the general message is that this thing we should do more of over time. So we'll ramp up activity into that one. This one we should probably do less of over time. So we'll just start tapering away the activity in that. This one perhaps needs to be scaled to the right size for that particular people who are using it. And so that's our proposed kind of approach for that. So with all of those, and I think we're quite comfortable with being bold around saying, that was a market failure then, it is not a market failure now, or at least not how it was originally defined. What's the market failure now and will we add value into that? Addressing something just because it's a market failure, had, we need some good justification behind that. And there are some good ones for a lot of the pieces we do. So we're quite open to discussion on any of the things we do and how we should do more or less of them. But as I said, it's really very interesting how different the opinions are on where the emphasis should be across the different states. And so to some extent for us, it's to say, well, this is what all of your colleagues have been saying as well. And this is a kind of path that we think we can take through all of that. Unlikely that anyone will get everything they want. Hopefully everyone will get some of what they want. Um, but the role for the ARDC is still fluid and how we fit into those various pieces is a, is a very good question. So I think we'll produce this document middle of December and that'll be the time to say, no, nah, that thing should be switched off or you've made a mistake. This thing is actually critical to what we do and we need more of that. Um, the second question around how, we, how do we plan to uh, make sure everybody can exploit the skills program? Is that kind of what you're saying. Um, Natasha can probably talk about that during the skills session. But again, that skills program has for us has been more around training the trainers and making sure that the resources are available and making sure that there's a, you know, a reliable place to keep those materials. There is additional scope for developing a community around the actual people who deliver skills and how we can make sure that that is done in the most effective way. That there are some great models from overseas about how we can develop a skills and workforce development program. There are different sectors in there which we can focus on too. Research software engineers is one that's brought up um, at times the same way that data scientists and various other things were brought up over time. And some of that is not necessarily around creating the skills, it's around advocating for that community within institutions so they recognize the value themselves and that's part of our sustainability model is to say us valuing someone is fine so long as it fits within our kind of priorities and agendas but much more powerful for them to be valued within their institutions so good question and natasha will be very interested to hear your comments and suggestions that's it ashwara guru uh, the increased capability and as well as the research uh, RCC in UQ. So, so in one of the, in the NPS roadmap, it was mentioned that um, 
the new ARDC, or it was not called ARDC at that time, will be heavily influenced from the European Open Science Cloud. So I was just wondering whether is that still true and then uh, what will be the uh, influence of the, um, the you know, whatever the strategic direction the ARDC takes in the, how the uh, European Open Science has evolved. Yeah, so yes, we're keeping in close touch with what's happening in the European Open Science Cloud and that has, that's a huge activity I guess if you look at some of the stuff we do as being a mini version of that across states rather than countries, a lot of that is coordination and uh, alignment and visibility of activities. So yes, we're still keeping a close eye on EOC, but we're not modeling ourselves necessarily on the EOSC, right? So where there are valuable bits we can pull out, they're the bits we'll pull out. And in fact, where there are valuable bits we can contribute back, we try to contribute those back. Thanks. Um, Jeff Christensen from the Australian Bioinformatics Commons Pathfinder Project. Um, I guess I just had a question about fair infrastructure and, and I guess you could imagine that as a sort of, you know, researchers having access to a hybrid sort of infrastructure that may include, you know, aspects like Nectar Cloud and other national, you know, nationally provide resources like NCI, PAUSI and, and have the network from Arnet. I was just wondering, um, how strategically important or embedded as a concept is fairness to those other providers in sort of coming on board um, in providing this kind of hybrid infrastructure? Yeah, okay, good question and very variable, right? So you know some communities bake fair into everything they do. And if your data is not open, you don't get to use their capability, whereas others much less so. And I think that's one of the beauties of fair is that fair is a, is a contextual description, so FAIR within bioinformatics. You can still be gold standard FAIR within bioinformatics, but it might be a very different actual thing to FAIR within marine or astronomy. So I think FAIR as a concept is uh, a work in progress about demonstrating the value of, of FAIR. So for us, there's a functional piece about making sure you can find and access and use those pieces effectively because they're investments we make and we want as many people as possible to benefit from that. For a researcher, making their data fair is not, uh, is not an easy sell. There's not much in it for them. You don't get a promotion for it. You don't get a grant for it. So we're working with the funding bodies around that saying, well, if you want long life and reusability for your data, then you'd need to come up with some reward mechanism for that as well. So FAIR is a priority for us, but it's contextualised by the partners we work with. So the Bioinformatics Commons for us is not primarily a FAIR exercise. It's actually a, a couple of pieces. What's a really good thing for refining an already quite sophisticated community? but also what's the state of play internationally around some of those underpinning research infrastructures and what can we learn from that for our research infrastructure conversation? And that's some of that's a bit less fairy and a bit more actually hard worky. We need to come up with solutions for the storage, the, the compute cloud, the platforms. Yep. Uh, so a question from one of the Zoom participants, Steve McEachan. Uh, are there any plans to consider how better to support sensitive data? That is data which needs to be accessible but can't be open. Yes. Uh, and sensitive data is something that's uh, the one thing that's been brought up consistently in every meeting we've had. So it's a hot topic and sensitive data means different things again for different people. So if it's medical data is one thing, survey data is another thing. Um, we would like to be led by the communities who are worrying specifically about sensitive data. So institutions have a view around sensitive data, which is not necessarily the same as uh, a medical practitioners view around sensitive data. And we're looking at activities with, with various partners there to say, well, perhaps what, what are some steps we can go towards defining sensitive data, uh, where we can add value uh, and where we can add value in a way that again, that community has enough momentum behind it that it can survive without us. So yes, we're doing a lot around sensitive data. It's not, an, not something we're pushing in particular, but it's something that's been brought to us a lot and we would like to see where we can add value to that. Time's up. All right, thank you very much. I'll just whiz off to the three questions again and hand over to 
my colleague Michelle Barker, who will lead us through this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of uh, the ARDC. We are now going to spend half an hour with each of you um, joining a small group discussion so that we can really maximise our hearing from uh, you on your ideas and benefiting from your expertise. And each group will focus on answering all of these three questions. What should we do more of or start doing? What should the ARDC do less of or stop doing? And what should the ARDC do differently? There'll be a staff member from the ARDC joining each group as note taker. And when we come back together at 11.30, they'll report back on what each group's come up with, uh, which will take us through to the break at 12. To split into the groups, uh, we're going to use the poll demographics to help identify where there might be common areas of interest. So I'm going to suggest we have one group uh, around NCRIS capabilities, one group around e-research service providers, and the other three groups focused around institutions. Now, you don't have to go to a particular group, even if you are an e-research provider, you can choose to go to an institution-focused grouping. Uh, they might end up uh, much more eclectic, but we'll offer that opportunity if people want to congregate uh, with like-minded people to get uh, their different viewpoints on how to answer those questions. And Keith, do we have a Zoom group? Yes. All right, so physically, we might in that back corner uh, put the e-research service providers. Uh, in the other back corner, put the NCRIS capabilities and then have three loosely institutionally centric groups here uh, around the middle uh, board table and uh, back here on this side. So if you'd like to move to wherever feels comfortable and uh, we'll give you a, a staff member's note taker. Hello all. Um, so that was the end of the plenary bit for now and um, the in the plenary room they'll now be doing the breakout discussions and what we can do here is do a similar breakout discussions around those three questions and um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts um, please throw them into the mix and um, at the end I'll then be able to contribute them back in as, as each of the groups will feed back into the plenary uh, so I'll unmute you uh, yeah, I'm trying unmute to figure that out. and just throw your thoughts into the mix uh, about things that uh, ARDC should do um, more of, new, um, stop doing or do differently. So first of all, I'll unmute you and then um, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts. Here we go, one moment. You are now unmuted. I've got a comment here if you don't know, mind. I don't know if that's a suggestion or rather a question. Um, following up on Steve's question, um, is there consideration to consider data, the data marketplace model, where there can be a continuum of data openness and value exchange between producers and consumers of data? Oh, I can hear you now. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, so Jason Bell here from CP University. Um, one of the comments I guess I wanted to, um, to provide back or, or to keep going was initially when a lot of the um, Nectar and RDSI and all that sort of stuff was funded. Um, it funded infrastructure, but no service wrappers or anything else like that that made the use of that infrastructure um, easy. And one of the things that I've seen um, more lately, and um, particularly from an acute perspective, is that they're adding additional wrappers, making infrastructure more accessible and easier to use, so that uh, researchers from the long tail and, and groups who didn't have uh, built-in IT support could actually leverage um, some of those infrastructure and services and so my opinion would be to, to continue with that and you know ensure that whatever funding goes into you know storage compute and all of those sort of things that service wrappers be applied so they can make it more easy easy to use you know and moving forward it would be great where there was a research um, infrastructure that, like a lot of these commercial um, entities, that you know, it's a one-stop install for you know a, a website or you know a um, um, oh I can't think of the, the the names at the moment, but where they can actually you know have no IT skills and leverage some of the um, services and things out there that you know would make it uh, more easy to use. Okay. 
Thanks, Jason. That's uh, anybody. Any thoughts on that? Any echo that, or have different ideas on that? Hi, Keith. It's Stephen Keckerin here. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is sort of interesting to sort of reflect on that long tail discussion. That that question of how to uh, um, enable those with uh, who might be have the lower level of IT skills. I don't think we can assume none. Um, that's yeah. You know, that there probably ought to be at least some level of you know expectation on the user side. Um, that said, um, making a, making the, re the the requirement lower than it is now, I think is certainly um, uh, that that ought to be a um, uh, a goal uh, for any of the infrastructure, particular, but particularly those servicing the long tail. Is to say that the <clears throat> the set of requirements that are there to you know initially make use of the infrastructure that, that currently exists. Um, mitigate against certain disciplines or you know certain communities. I think um, so. I think there's a there's a happy medium there that probably pushes towards the lower um, skill you know skill requirements rather than the higher. Uh, but yeah, uh, trying to push push in that direction, I think would be uh, commendable. It also makes it more scalable. You know, I, I think um, this is the other question that. Um, some of, some of the infrastructures that do exist are actually uh, relatively small in terms of the audience that they, that, that they can support. Um, if you're pushing into some of the, the, the broader disciplinary domains and, you know, PASS is my thing, of course, but um, it, you, you have to be operating at a different level of scale than, than some of the systems are currently thinking about. Okay, yeah. Um, so my thoughts on, on that, since Kiran here, uh, is that I think one of the roles of ARDC is to lower the barriers for, for the research in Australia, whether it's at the peak or whether it's at the, the tail end and the long tail. Um, so sort of lift everybody's game up. I think um, there's been a bit of a mix in the past of how that's happened. Anybody else, any thoughts on this topic? It's Beryl here from TURN. Um, I find ARDC is, has a, a bit of a schism in, is it there to serve interest groups or is it there to be a national infrastructure in its own rights? Um, and if it is a national research infrastructure, what purpose does it feel that others aren't filling already? Um, and I just wonder whether there's a component of both possible within its remit um, I think the others who've spoken have suggested that the other national research um, infrastructure capabilities struggle to cover off on the data side of it because they are experts in particular domains but not necessarily expert in the data domain. So I think that there needs to be value add from, the, uh, from within the um, INCRIS program of a group that acts as wise council um, coordinator, etc., of, of how we proceed with data. And then there's obviously uh, an innovative role that ARDC holds as national research infrastructure in its right, own right to, to sort of make um, as much, not just uh, the the other increased capabilities, but research data groups in Australia that much more um, capable to... Beryl, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Where did you get up to? Uh, innovative role, research data groups. Uh, that's where you cut out. Yeah, yeah. I'm hopeless at remembering what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a service to increase groups because I think we need some leadership and also a service to uh, re as research infrastructure in its own right. Yeah. But I think that there's need for both to be there so um, and, and not to be lost. Yeah. So I think your, your argument there was to, ha to make sure that both is involved in, in the way ARDC operates and the, uh, the aims we have. And uh, yeah, so you mentioned the value add, why, providing a wise counsel to increase facilities, and uh, probably, uh, but also having a sort of innovative role towards national research infrastructure and data infrastructure more broadly. Is that right? Sounds. Oh, you're. 
that sound, sounds um, um, like a good argument. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Beryl. Okay. Um, I'd yeah. like to add a few thoughts in here. Um, I, I was pleased with what Ian said at the beginning how of the reason why Nectar, RDS and ANS came together, one reason was to have a common language um, on that. I think that's needed across the sector as well, a, a common language that we can all speak to. Um, the, so I think it's good to use ARDC and, and, and say, you know, how do you shape the environment as a cross-cutting thing that we can have a common language, we can talk about the, not just the technologies, but also the, uh, the interoperabilities and the, the people in the organizations. Um, how do we come together? And what's a common language we can use? Um, adding to that, in my comment, I was asking the question I had, you know, what's the thoughts on marketplace, a data marketplace? Uh, that I think you know uh, seems like one of the concepts that is the next evolution from where we have been around fair data, open data. Uh, how do we build that continuum of not just making data open because there is a, a range of steps in between uh, private data and open data, which all make sense and have different value exchange between the, the data provider or data creator and the consumer. Uh, and different dynamics in there. Uh, and I think we need that level of maturity going forward if we're gonna continue to lead, lead the way in these things. And I think ARDC plays a critical role in being able to influence that, catalyze those kind of things, at least start to catalyze those conversations and dialogues across the country. Yeah, so your, your point is um, that ARDC could play a role in influencing, catalyzing dialogue around the data marketplace, but also just more generally around finding a common language across the sector, uh, around technology, but also interoperability in people and organizations. Is that sort of a summary? Less about the technology, but about how the models and patterns that are there for bringing the data bring extracting the value out of that um, in organizations coming together to do things so uh, there's social and the the technical dynamics of things okay thanks uh, hi it's Sean Walpole um, look I'm representing uh, Brisbane Diamantina I'm sort of new to this so I'm actually learning a lot from listening rather than anything else today um, what I'd like to say, I think, is the most important part is the interoperability of data and sharing across sources. We need to be totally independent of technology. Um, and as I come from the health sector, our biggest problem relates to the privacy issues, which still drive problems. And we need something uh, nationally which allows us to get by this because it leaves us with lots of solos, uh, silos which do not interconnect well. And therefore, even if you take something like AHAW, which links data but really doesn't have individual patient data really well organised such that it counts events rather than a longitudinal history of people um, so that you get some biases in the data. So we need to work out how the interoperability sharing while maintaining privacy to whatever standard that we're made to follow um, comes, to exist, uh, comes to fruition. So, Steve, how does that, um, I'm intrigued, Steve, does that resonate and connect with your comment around sensitive data and looking at yeah. sensitive data? Yeah, there, there, are, uh, there are a number of dimensions to the sensitivity that I would say this is why I'd like that to be a, a, you know, a fairly broad discussion. Um, I work with medical researchers, I work with you know, sociologists, I work with uh, environmental scientists. We all have different elements of sensitivity but there are some common th threads that actually run through them as well. Um, and, you know, so the sorts of questions that were, points that were just being raised um, are not dissimilar to things you might see in some of the longitudinal studies we deal with. And increasingly, uh, those studies are bringing together biometric, genomic, 
social survey, you know, the integration of those things, as, as has been pointed out, connecting those things up is just more and more that, you know, the more important research questions I think are being addressed in, in our space by doing that, those, those sorts of interoperability, uh, addressing those interoperability questions. So yeah, um, that's part of that story. Um, and I think to talk about them in, in disciplinary terms, uh, which can be the case, um, must, you know, sort of separates the conversation that does need to cross over some of these domains as well. So I'd, I'd be encouraging that. Uh, it's John Latanzio here. I'm uh, uh, chair of the Science Advisory Committee for Astronomy Australia Limited, and we're having a meeting about computing infrastructure in a week or so. Um, I don't, I don't want to be contrary, but I'm a little bit. I'm really glad I don't have to do this because I, I think it's almost impossible to do what you're trying to do and more strength to you and we should all try to help. But I, I mean, I don't know how uniform we really want things to be. I understand exactly all of the privacy concerns of the medical side of privacy. But if you set up some system that's got that and astronomy is subject to it, that's just an enormous burden on the astronomy data because we don't need that. And you know, uh, what we need may well be different to what other people need. And so I'm not quite sure how uniform you can make it without then having a, an extra burden on the, uh, the people providing the, the, the infrastructure. So I think we should make it as uniform as possible, but not overdo it. My university keeps coming up with templates for everybody to use for their PowerPoint presentations, and they're just not appropriate for everybody. I mean, by that, by that logic, the astronomers will be buying, you know, test tubes just like the chemists. You know, there has to be some differences somewhere. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I think the point, though, is where there are. So it's trying to identify those spaces where there are potentially agri, sort of, a, you know, an economic argument where you can aggregate um, uh, some of these capabilities together. That's where I think you'd want to be seeing, you know let's try and share where those things exist, but not to try and say, no, these things apply to everyone. In the same way that, let's say, um, sort of my statement was, you know, not everything can be open. Um, so the whole open data movement is great, and I'm strongly in favour of it, but not if it, it, it raises issues in terms of addressing, uh, compromising some other considerations in some of the fields that I work in. So it, it's, it, it is the same argument, I think, but yes know what your data is and know what the communities you're trying to support uh, and trying to, trying to aggregate it where that makes sense, but not, you know, foresee it where it doesn't. Which is all way too hard for me, which is why I'm glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'd agree with, with, with both of those. I think it's about looking at the set of patterns that emerge, I think, and, and being able to reuse some of those patterns and not keep reinventing it over and over again um, but not saying there's one pattern that everybody must follow. Okay, that's a good point, not one pattern. Yeah. Um, so um, one of, up till now we've sort of been talking about the way things that ARDC could do or things we could focus on or perhaps yes, yeah, focus on mainly. Question also there was a question about what should we stop doing? Um, so I'd be very intrigued to your, your thoughts around what should AOC, AODC stop doing or maybe do differently? Things you think that's not working or where we should take a different approach? Um, or things that you think, well, that's actually not, not something that ARDC could put effort or, to, uh, effort or money into into the future. Hi, Keith, Frank, you here. Hi, um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Because my mic is having trouble at the moment. Yeah, I can hear you. You're coming in and out a bit, but you're okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess one of the challenges that um, ARDC and, and its, its prior entities have had to date is the uptake and uh, trust of their services around the research communities in Australia. And I guess um, one of the reasons why uptake uh, is a factor is that the research community don't necessarily want to invest in learning uh, new infrastructure or, or using um, national infrastructure if it's not, um, you know, if it doesn't have a, a, lo a long lifespan ahead of its um, ahead. So I guess one of the things that I'd be keen for ARDC to do differently is to make sure 
that the focus ARDC has is on innovative and translational, uh, transformational um, aspects, and that if anything becomes BAU, sort of, you know, um, something that's used by researchers on a day-to-day -day basis, that that gets shifted off onto a sustainable provider um, as soon as possible. Um, whether that's a single provider or multiple providers, it doesn't matter, but I guess it's that those providers have the trust of the research communities and they understand that those services are not uh, at the whim of future government investments and that they're, they're stable. So that's, that's one thing I'd, I'd be keen to, for ARDC to, um, to move to in the future. Okay. Thanks, Frankie, I, I agree. I'm just wondering if the, those stable uh, environments exist for many um, domains. Yeah. Well, uh, many yeah. So I, I guess ARDC has got a, yeah, and as, as Beryl was saying, there's a uh, domain focus, but then there should also be a national focus. So there are national entities out there that have uh, services geared towards the research communities that are sustainable. I guess it's whether or not those should be expanded upon to, you know, cater more strongly for domains if, if domain support is what's needed. Or maybe it's possible that this can be looked at sort of nationally without domain focus, but I think, I think it probably needs both. Um, also, just to uh, add to that comment is that um, I, I agree completely with Frankie in the sense that Researchers have been burnt using uh, research infrastructure before because it's here one day and gone the next, and um, depending on funding cycles and things like that. And um, you know, part of my role is to, um, I guess, help to increase uptake and, and get people using these services. But you know, when the, the common message out there is that you know, it may not be there forever. Um, you know, people go and look at other alternatives. Um, to, to do that's something that they know is going to be around for a long time. Now, whilst I agree that you know research funding is finite and it can never be guaranteed, I think if we set up some models or, or some capabilities and such that if a service is very popular and used a lot, then you know can it be rolled out or, or moved or, or, or changed? In, in a way that um, it then becomes a sustainable service and you know, will continue running um, for a long time because you know, nothing's worse for researchers in the sense that they use a service or, or put stuff on an infrastructure that in one or two years time, they've got to go and learn a completely new system because that's been decommissioned or, or no longer um, available. And so whilst there will always be people at the bleeding edge and want to use the latest and greatest, you know, there are people who are prevented from doing that because they're just not sure whether it will be around. And, you know, going back past history, there have been services that have been completely cut and nothing to replace them. And so that's something that, you know, keeps our researchers and colleagues wary. Any other questions or thoughts around that sustainability challenge of infrastructure and services and offerings being provided through ARDC, how that carries forward? I think there's, sorry, Keith, I'll, just a quick comment on that. I, I think that ties into that long tail discussion we had before, which is um, a, a little bit, I mean, if we actually look, and, and maybe I'm being a bit uh, domain specific here, actually, but um, with the, certainly within the, the social sciences, um, the, the basically delivery of commercial products, I mean, it, it, we rely on commercial products fairly heavily for the, the services that we're using and and I'm thinking here specifically on software um, but there is a you know a business capability there um, and we haven't really had to develop domain specific well, there's some, some algorithms within there that, that have been relevant but for the most part so the core functionality sits on every desktop in every every lab in every university um, so there is the capacity to move in that direction for, for certain domains, I think. But again, it sort of comes back to that scalability question that's there. Um, I, you know, we don't want to be sort of trying to develop um, bespoke solutions if you're trying to scale them up to, you know, the, the thousands or tens of thousands of users. Um, so I'm not quite sure if they, you know, how those two things come together, but I don't think it's, um, 
I think it's not coincidental. Um, so, you know, being able to leverage, you know, the resource, the, the, the systems and resources that are already there, probably, um, there's probably something underlying that. Um, and, but how, you know, how you best support that tying into what Frankie's talking about there um, is, well, how are you going to scale the delivery of those facilities, the, those small scale facilities? across very large numbers of users, which is a different sort of dynamic. So, so if I, I'm trying to, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to un, unpack a little bit. You're talking about sustainability challenges and you're talking about uh, don't develop small scale solutions uh, so, that, actually, that actually will not be sustainable and scalable to, to a larger group of users down the track. No, I, no. no, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit, Different, say, I'm just just thinking here is why are those why have those solutions continued to to um, work fairly well, at least on the software side within our disciplines? Um, it's probably because they um, uh, they have a broad base of users, um, and there's a relatively low number of them. But they've also managed to produce, you know, um, well, there's been commercial options and, and non-commercial options as well. Um, but they have a, a broad base so that you have enough users who can, ad, ad, you know, allow you to address this question of sustainability by spreading the, um, the, the long-term support for those systems. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, any other? Yeah, I was just going to add a little bit more on that is, um, I guess where I'm coming from is not so much about um, a piece of software stack or, or something to that, but more in the infrastructure and the resources available. Like, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, you know, something like the Arcs Data Fabric, in which it had quite a number of people using it, and I was promoting it internally, and then it disappeared and there was no um, solution available that allowed people to store their data for, you know, for a couple of years afterwards. And if you have a look at um, the Arnet uh, Cloud Store, in big bold letters, they says they're sustainable and that they plan to provide this solution indefinite. Now that gives a lot more reassurance than something like, here is some virtual machines, i.e. Nectar, or here is some storage, RDS, and that may or may not be around in, you know, five years' time when the next funding cycle comes around. And, and that provides um, some concern because people may get in and develop a, uh, some cloud or cloud resources via Nectar, which is based on OpenStack and that sort of stuff, and they have it working well. It disappears, and it may not be simple for them to convert that to then run on Amazon or, or whatever it else might be. And so, you know, whereas if... You know, if they build it in Amazon, they know that that's going to be around for, for quite some time and more than just funding cycles. And so I guess that's what I was more, you know, um, talking about was the infrastructure and the services that apply on top rather than, you know, our Pacific stack per se. Any, any other thoughts? So, so that, a lot of that discussion around what things we should stop doing or do differently around the sustainability challenge for services and making sure that they move on to business as usual. Uh, is, are there any other things, any other thoughts around things we should stop doing, uh, pieces of work that perhaps are not useful or considerations in uh, our decisions about what we should not do and what we should do? Um, um, sorry, on you go, you go. Uh, Beryl, okay. yes. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say one thing I've stopped doing is being risk averse. I think um, there's a very long period since the investment was announced and still no certainty about where, we, where ARDC is going and what the rest of us should do. And so it's putting on hold a lot of other people's work. So I think that uh, decisions need to be made fairly urgently to move on. Okay, thanks. Um, Kieran, I think we're actually about to go back to Kieran. Do you want to add a last thing into the? Um, then I'll no, no, I think that's up. fine. It was, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, th thank you all for your thoughts. Uh, what we now go back into the plenary session and there we'll read out for the different groups what were the sort of the main findings. Um, I think two find two things that so uh, I'll, I'll try and sort of summarise. I think 
two main points uh, on what we should stop doing uh, or, or do differently is around well, stop being risk averse and the, and the question around sustainability and making sure that infrastructure and services uh, have a have a longer term home, a reliable, trusted home, uh, which could be at, which could which will be outside the ARDC if it's more business as usual. Uh, there was also a range of different uh, perspectives of what we should be doing and, and taking into account. Um, looking at infrastructures, making them easy to use, having service wrappers on top of them, um, dropping requirements, um, looking at the supporting both national research infrastructure and uh, NCRIS facilities, and developing a common language across the sector, and uh, looking at privacy, uh, privacy data, yeah, that's Ewan's point. Um, but, and when we're talking about the common language, it should not be uh, one language for all, but rather taking into account differences between disciplines. Um, I think that was not, it wasn't one language for all, it wasn't one pattern for all. Yeah, not one pattern for all, that's a nice one, yes. Yeah. Then there's, there's common problems, but different solution patterns is how I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll, I hope that sort of captures the main points. Anything else I've not captured there? I'll try and elaborate a little bit more when I report back. Okay. In that case, I'll go back and then uh, we should be able to hear the sound from the, uh, the, the main meeting group. All of Thanks. the bioplatforms DVL being repurposed for HES use. Uh, but also a note that we needed a top-down approach as well, which looks at who are our end users, because um, that can give us a, a broader picture of large-scale change, not just repurposing. We can repurpose something that's already there, but is that actually a good use, uh, or, or do we need to develop something else that promotes uh, a, a different way of working? So we wanted also clarity around services uh, and how they can be used. So perhaps a service catalogue or a, a bigger map of what we have now. We wanted to get e-research folk on the ground up to speed on platforms, uh, promotion across institutions, uh, and also uh, maybe lists of general terms so everyone knows they're talking about the same things, which is particularly difficult across disciplines. We had an idea to set aside some funding for documentation that can make things more accessible or um, promoted. So this thing has happened, this is what's happened at our institution, um, here's some information about it, it happening uh, and that would hopefully lead to more accessibility um, and be an interdisciplinary aid and, and last on that we had metrics how do we know we're doing this properly um, and we need to have particularly interdisciplinary discussion about what these agreed standards are so moving on to point two what should we do less of or stop doing um, prior to any other discussion we said well we don't know yet because we need a mapping activity so that we can know um, what's there um, and that map should all be there. Regarding uh, some specific points, uh, with virtual labs, we, we need to remove unnecessary duplication uh, across those platforms. Um, and this also fits into a wider discussion uh, about standardisation. So standardisation will help us know what we have too much of or not enough of or how things could work better together. Um, and infrastructure should be fit for its purpose. And if it's not, we need to look at uh, making changes there should also have more than one person responsible for dealing with that feedback and uh, giving advice and institutions want to be really involved with that. Um, and again, more gap analysis to reveal the need for less or more of. On the third point, what should we do differently? There was a concern that ARDC is in transition and though the timeline is aggressive, there's been a perception it's not fast enough. So it would be great if there was more action things being done quickly so that we know where we're going. Um, on that note, taking staff from institutions on semi-permanent uh, or semi-temporary contracts has been really problematic for institutions. It creates holes that are hard to fill uh, and it would be nice if there's more certainty there. So perhaps uh, better contracts or methods of staffing. Um, and for the, the people themselves, we need to think about, is this good for their career progression and some clarity about the terms of contracts for people doing ARDC work? Do secondments help institutions? Perhaps not. Do secondments help AIDC? Perhaps not. Um, perhaps they do. We need some analysis there. What we know is that cherry picking of staff is not working very well for institutions um, and they'd like to see some metrics about it so that they can engage on that. Um, they'd like to know is there more of a plan? 
and can we make contracts um, in the meantime faster so that we have some clarity. Following from that, it would be nice if there were, were more clear communication uh, methods set up with ARDC, so mechanisms about sharing what we're doing. So we've got institutions who've got work being done in CICs, for example, and they don't want to duplicate the work there with ARDC planning um, and activities. So there needs to be a, a bottom-up as well as a top-down approach. Hi, Nigel Ward, um, acting as special advisor to ARDC. You forgot to tell everyone that I'm special, Ian, but <laughs> I like to repeat it every time. Um, so our group uh, was, I think, predominantly meant to be about e-research providers, but we had general general group there, really. Um, what should ARDC do more of? Uh, there was a comment about giving fairer access to language data as, broader, as part of a broader humanities movement. And there's a bit of a discussion later on about um, in the humanities, maybe focusing on data provision rather than analytics could be the focus. Um, a suggestion to focus on the A in ARDC, so focus on more national coordination, Australian coordination, common infrastructure, common approaches. Uh, suggestion to bring communities together from end to end, from collection of data through aggregation, analysis, creation of knowledge and translation, actually try and do that end to end with particular communities and even across disciplines. A uh, bit of a discussion about supporting non-technical researchers, and this was not just training, this was about providing them access to sysadmins, DevOps, uh, that sort of thing, and also developing that capability within research communities. Um, interoperable infrastructure, make sure all the bits work together in the commons, as well as more reliable infrastructure, particularly if we're starting to talk about translation to commercial, we actually need more reliable infrastructure. Um, as part of that translation discussion, we talked about engaging more with industry and government. It was noted that there aren't any industry or government people here today, and that's maybe an oversight. Um, and how, how do we align with commercial interests and, and support their sensitivity requirements, and what's the relationship between that and, and FAIR? Um, suggestion that ARDC could start learning the lessons of the past and mandating design principles, best practices in its platform and infrastructure rollout. So for example, mandating single sign-on through AEF or common data protocols or common data, common provenance tracking. Uh, and a suggestion that ARDC could engage more deeply in that sense with projects and bring its lessons, previous lessons learned to bear on new projects. Information needs to flow both ways. All right, what should ARDC do less of? Uh, there was a particular virtual lab uh, in linguistics that was mentioned that maybe should be shut down because it, the feeling of the, some people in that in our group was that it wasn't delivering a move away from analytics in linguistics more to just data provision. Um, less collection, less focus on collection med, level metadata in RDA, more focus on item level metadata. That's what researchers want. They don't want to know about the collection, they actually want the data. Um, and suggestion that was frustrating or useless to have data that's described but not available. Uh, some, the suggestion that some things that AIDC has done in the past, invested in the past, are now just part of the culture, so perhaps we don't need to reinvest in those. So FAIR, the feeling was that FAIR is quite widely known across the sector now. Maybe we can wind that investment down. Another suggestion was to uh, we should transfer leadership over time from ARDC to the partners as a way of sustaining effort. Which leads on to what we should do differently. Uh, uh, let's see. Continuity was important. Year-on-year uh, -year funding means we lose staff. We heard Siobhan talk a bit about the staffing issues earlier. Um, acknowledge it's about sustainability of services, not projects. Uh, let's see, improve and measure quality of services to help sustain them. There, there was a bit of a discussion about the mismatch between some of the principles that Ian mentioned earlier, the uh, mismatch between sustainability and, uh, in, uh, and fair, fair principles. You know, fair is about uh, is opening it up, but why would an institution invest in, in fair data? And fair limits commercial engagement. Uh, open the door to a platform renewal, maybe do an open call for, for platforms again, because that lets us bring in your investment part partners and longer term partnerships through state governments. Uh, mediate relationships between institutions and other providers. 
and I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Nigel. Um, we, we covered some of those points. So just briefly, um, we, we didn't go through the questions uh, in, in that order. So I'll just summarise the, the things that uh, we did go through. Um, so we thought the storage um, infrastructure was great, but there's not enough integration around joining up the separate services that are being created. Um, platform and tools are well provided in some areas, but other areas are, are lacking or haven't been neglected initially, um, specifically the, the Hass area. Um, they, uh, people within the group like the idea of, of what's going on in, in uh, UTS where they've got sort of a diagram of of the all of the services and how they all join up and interact and, and work together and some people would like to see more of that sort of um, infrastructure building. Um, <clears throat> how do researchers find the services? So this is a, a bit of a, a problem because some of the, the people that um, are providing these services within institutions don't feel confident enough to, to engage in detailed discussion or um, promotion of the services um, that are provided and they would probably like to, to have their skill set lifted in that area so that they can or at least partner with ARDC to have experts available. Um, better so, so with the storage, better visualization and analysis tools would be would be great. It's not integrated at the moment in many areas, and uh, and, and the point was made that well, maybe it's up to institutions to develop uh, you know some a lot of these services, but with support of, of ARDC as opposed to expecting ARDC to provide them more all, all themselves. And then we we talked about sensitive data and how much of a special case that is, and how much um, support that could be provided there would be useful. So. Uh, thank you very much. This is the first for two things. Firstly, I followed the questions in this particular breakout and secondly, I wrote them on my computer for the first time. So uh, please bear with me. We had a very enthusiastic group uh, with a slant um, toward institutions and e-research capabilities, either NCRIS or otherwise. Uh, and what, we, what, what, what came out about wanting to do more of or to start doing, we saw great value in increasing the international uh, reputation and presence of Australia uh, Australian Year Research and uh, AIDC had a clear role in doing that, continuing what ANS had started but also extending that into other areas where um, uh, the influence was, was apparent. Um, Australia has an opportunity to be a bridge between the major centres in Year Research around the globe and we should make use of that. Um, examples of international um, uh, interaction uh, occurred with um, training resources, or uh, other standards and interoperability. Uh, one thing that was raised as a risk was that there is uh, the uh, uh, geopolitical sensitivities that need to be taken into account, but that's something that uh, ARDC can take on rather than individual organizations. Um, there was a very big notion to add value to existing capabilities and existing services, uh, particularly around negotiated access for mutual benefit uh, we had examples of walled gardens in public assets and uh, brokering roles that allowed disciplines to work with each other rather than against them. Uh, and this extended into brokering for services um, and expertise as well. Uh, what we should do less of or stop doing, there was almost consensus that bespoke infrastructure is not the future, um, whereas bespoke services were the future. So that's good news for me, bad news for Nigel. Um, cloud is considered generally an embedded tech now. Uh, it's not novel anymore. Uh, and the idea as a platform of a service has gained a lot of traction with our group. We should stop supporting discipline focused services and instead support services that could be used by disciplines. Um, what we should do differently, uh, it might sound like a tautology, but we should plan for the future rather than the past. Um, and uh, we should focus on how we join up national capabilities and infrastructures uh, to support the coherence activity. That's one of the um, uh, things that's already been flagged quite a lot in our strategy, so that's great. Um, and uh, then we, find we, we finished up talking about um, having a data focus on national 
persistence of data and how that might look and how that might work. And it's something that a national organization needed to do rather than any one individual organization. And AIDC had a clear role to facilitate that rather than actually take responsibility for it. Um, uh, I realize that I've probably missed some people's conversations. Was there anything that I'd missed that people wanted to point out? Yes, well, they are, they are a long way away, so it makes it a bit hard for them to put up their hands. Um, so that's from the Zoom, uh, uh, the Zoom group. It was a wonderful, very lively conversation um, with reps from um, all sorts of different areas, NCRIS, research infrastructure, institutions, research organizations, uh, MRIs. So it was a lovely mix. A um, number of points came up. Um, first of all, well, things we should do, uh, things we should focus on. Well, the view was lower, the aim of the ARDC is to lower the barriers for researchers to be able to conduct their research, make sure that addresses both the peak research but also long tail research. Um, the question came up for whom, where, where should the ARDC put its focus? Should it be on NCRIS facilities or on research, the broader research data infrastructure community out there in uh, Australia? And the, the uh, sort of the idea was that it should be both and we should have a good mix across those. Um, work we should do should look not just focus barely uh, on bare bones infrastructure, but provide infrastructure with service wrappers and uh, support across that so that uh, um, that infrastructure can you be used by a broader community um, with also lower IT skills so that makes it also accessible to longer tail uh, research. Um, there was a suggestion that uh, ARDC should influence and catalyze sort of the development of common language around infrastructure technology bring people and organizations together and sharing patterns in that space. Uh, one of the examples uh, of a uh, of a pattern in that space was the a data marketplace in which data can be shared through appropriate routes, making sure that people actually get uh, recognition or value back for the data that they have created. Um, uh, when, when we discussed that and discussed those patterns, there was also agreement that those patterns are not generic across all disciplines, but you need various patterns for various disciplines uh, with different questions. Um, Point was made about interoperability and sharing of uh, sensitive data, especially in the medical and health space, um, privacy, uh, addressing privacy issues in that space, looking at integration of a range of data types uh, that enables the answering of very valuable research questions in that space. And it is a complicated space and it's very, it's be very valuable if ARDC could play a role in pulling that together so that data can be brought together at the national level. The question about doing stopping doing stopping things or doing things differently. Um, the uh, main point there in the discussion was uh, don't set up infrastructure or solutions that get turned off. It would be great to have infrastructure and solutions that researchers can trust and can build on and can keep on using. So the idea there was to focus that the AIDC should focus on innovative and transformative uh, um, um, uh, activities and investments and then uh, once services become more established transfer those to sustainable trusted providers and they can take it up as business as usual uh, about things that ARDC should stop or do differently uh, please stop being risk averse don't slow down make decisions and move on so that uh, everybody can sort of work together and benefit from the ARDC so thanks mm. thanks Keith anyone else no, good. All right. Yes, thank you to all of you for your inputs. Uh, we take all of the data from each of these sessions across the seven consults we do across Australia and combine them uh, to then utilise in our planning of dra in drafting the strategic plan. And uh, um, uh, we'll also put the notes of these sessions available uh, online in, in, in due course so that people can review what other sessions have come up with. Uh, we're about to break for lunch from 12 to 12.45. When we come back at 12.45, it's not all to this room. So you have a choice of four satellite sessions. If you look on the agenda, there's uh, four detailed uh, on primarily on the back of the agenda. Agendas are available down the back if you haven't seen them or they should be online. There's the skilled workforce session, which will be led by Natasha Simons down the front here. And that'll be in room, it's written on the agenda. Do you want to tell us, Andy, where some of the rooms are? Yep, so the, the skills is in the, in the library. So those that know the, the large building out towards the, the left here, I think most people know the library here. It's on the top floor in V714. The other two 
rooms uh, for infrastructure, it's P419 and FAIR is, which is this room, and then FAIR, which is room 504. So if you go out of this room up the stairs, you'll see directly in front of you two rooms, 504 and 505. 504 will be FAIR and 505 will be platforms. Thanks, Andy. And Andy is our star coordinator of uh, all the details of today, which we very much appreciate. So you can choose which session you come back to after lunch. Uh, those sessions meet from 12.45 till 2.30. Then we all come back uh, for a bit of morning tea and afternoon tea. And from 2.45 till 3, then we have report back from those four sessions uh, before finally summing up. So thank you for your contributions this morning and I look forward to more this afternoon.